How to design multi-region, highly available data stores and databases. Today we'll find out. Let's go. Now this is part two of the high availability video series. And in the previous video, we have defined high availability. We've talked about those nines, what 99.9 .9 and so on means. And we've seen a sample architecture and we've learned how easy it is to build your own highly available web application in the cloud using DNS load balancing and application load balancing. And so if you haven't seen the previous video, I'll leave a link in the description. Make sure you check it out before you watch this one. So at the end of the last video, we've seen an architecture that was able to handle full regional failover. So in region A, something would happen. At the DNS level, we would redirect traffic to region B. And our requests would now just be you know, handled by our stateless web servers, web applications in the second region, in our fallback region, if you will. But we have not talked about the data stores. So the databases, the static assets, all of the data that was also in region A and now needed to be highly available in region B. And so a few people have asked about this and this is what we'll cover in the video today. A few different approaches of how to achieve high availability with your data stores. Plus we'll look at a sample architecture like we did last time. Before we dive into the how, we should look at the why. And uh, we need to keep that in the back of our mind because it's easy to compare different solutions and tools and you know consistency levels and whatnot. But sometimes we have a fairly simple requirement and we should fulfill that and everything else is you know maybe extra or nice to have. So I can think of four whys, if you will. The first one being, you know, how do we bring our data closer to users? So if we think about users of our applications and the geographical distribution of, of our users, multi-continent uh, uh, applications, you know, I have a big user base in the US, a big user base in Asia, for example. I want to bring data, whatever data it is, user profile data, assets, and so on, closer to them. And so this is about performance, this is about latency, and maybe it's also about um, you know, regulation. I need to keep data uh, in the same country or in the same you know, region, whatever. And there, if it's about performance, I can think of you know, caching. So this is actually a caching problem because we want to bring data that is being used by my, uh, by my customers uh, close to them, decreasing latency. Um, the second reason I can think of is maybe we want to replicate data. So we have it available in a failover scenario. So this is probably closer to what we're trying to achieve here. We're talking about high availability. And so having a replica of the data in the same region or in a different region or in the same availability zone or a different one, we can use it as a failover data store. So if something happens in our primary data store, we ideally automatically fail over to the second one. The third reason I can think of is uh, durability of the data, backup uh, data. And that's more about how do I make frequent copies of my data stores? How do I store them so I can access them very quickly if my primary data store uh, is somehow deleted or in, the, in modern times we often have ransomware attacks and this type of stuff. So this is about backups. And the last reason I can think of is creating a new layer of your data. So taking the data that your users are generating every day and bringing it into a different format, into a different place to gain more value from it, maybe for business intelligence reasons um, or to build new features. So isolating them, take making a copy or something similar, but still you know, isolating them for a different feature, different use case. So in this video, we're mostly concerned with the first two reasons. So bringing data closer to your users and having data, copies of your data or, you know, uh, replicas of your data available for failover reasons. Before we jump into the architecture part, we need to define a term and uh, this term is consistency. Consistency is something you will hear all the time when it comes to distributed systems. So here 
we are already talking about distributed systems because they are distributed uh, geographically across different data centers, for example. And as long as we were just talking about stateless web servers, for example, we didn't have to deal with consistency because we were just pushing this uh, problem down one layer. So we were able to just spin up more web servers of the same kind and they would do the exact same thing, but they would never store data of your users. Now we are at the point where we have to deal with this problem of consistency because we are dealing with data and state. And so consistency in a you know, very simple definition is just about the view of the world, so to say. You have two databases and they should reflect the exact same you know, uh, uh, data, the exact same state. And when you're dealing with a multi-region or multi-AZ system, it's clear, it's unavoidable that when you write into one store, data store, which is in, let's say, the US, and uh, you want the same data to be mirrored in your second data store in the EU, for example, there will be a delay. And this delay is where your two, where your two data stores, where your overall system is inconsistent for a short amount of time. So this is the, probably the strictest definition of consistency. It needs to be immediate, right? We already know that we will not be able to achieve immediate consistency because we're sending data across the world and it can, uh, at a maximum, only travel with the speed of light. But we need to think very clearly and, and, and deeply about what we expect from our applications and what we expect or what the applications expect from their underlying data stores. And by knowing that we will not achieve full consistency or strict consistency, we can deal with this and we can still build applications that uh, work well and, and work well for our users. Okay, so this is pretty much what we have seen in the last video towards the end. This is a two region architecture where we have EU West 1 and US East 1 and we have Route 53 as our DNS failover load balance uh, service if you want. And we've talked about how we use three availability zones in each of these regions with some sort of a stateless web server uh, serving requests, right? So here, this would be our, um, oh, this is just white, uh, our web app. And um, the point was we have stateless web applications, which can easily you know, be shut off. We can scale to more instances here, so we can duplicate web apps. We can shut them down. They can automatically you know, be replaced. But this data store down here, we didn't really talk about it all. And the challenge now becomes, what if this whole region, EU West 1, becomes unavailable? and we need to redirect traffic automatically to us was us east one right so imagine this left part here is gone this side will now serve all of our traffic us east one will serve all of our traffic this data store in eu west one would also be unavailable this could contain critical customer information it could contain all kinds of uh, business critical data and maybe we cannot serve our customers at all without this data. Currently as it is, this is what we call a um, single primary data store and we have no replications of this blue data store at all down here. Think back about the goals, the why that we have talked about earlier. And if the why is to protect against a full region outage, so a full outage of EU West 1, then this would not serve us at all, right? Because we would lose this data store in the EU West 1 region. But if our goal is to, for example, protect against outages of those web servers, of those web applications, which are caused by our own, you know, bugs, for example, then this is a fair approach, right? So what you would do is because you are changing the code 
um, adding features and doing stuff to those uh, web apps all the time, you could say, let me protect against introducing a outage of these web applications in EU West 1. And because we're using something like a staged or regional deployment mechanism, you could always deploy first to EU West 1 and see if this new deployment, if this new code change introduced any sort of um, issues. Um, at the same time, you could say if these web servers become unavailable because of a, an issue I introduced myself, I could always use this data store uh, in conjunction with the web apps in, uh, my, in my US East 1 region. So this would look like this. I would have um, my web app here, which would now direct traffic to this data store and same here, right? So all of them would do this. And this is a fair approach if the goal is to protect against my own kind of failings if uh, a, a deployment goes wrong on, on this left-hand side here. What needs to happen for this to work? Well, first of all, um, you need this kind of staged deployment approach where you always deploy new changes to EU West 1 first, and then you need to determine if that code change was successful or not. At the same time, or I would say previously, you uh, need to make sure that US East 1 here, so these web apps, these web servers, they are ready um, and they are already connected to the endpoint of Data Store 1 here, right? So this will be some sort of, a, of an endpoint here. I don't know, uh, db endpoint, whatever, uh, dot com. And um, that endpoint will stay, I would say, let's call it stable. Um, and this is a totally fair approach. Okay, so a different approach than just having a single primary uh, database is using read replicas. A read replica will give us at least one, maybe even two things. First of all, we can use it as another endpoint for our reads, only for the reads which are happening in that region, for example, and it will take off load from the primary. So in this case, we have still our primary on the left-hand side here. This is the primary and the web apps in EU West 1 will read and write from this primary. Our US East 1 web apps, they will be able to read from this read replica but they need to write uh, to the primary. So their writes from US East 1 will be uh, more expensive in terms of latency than the reads because they need to travel across regions. And then our uh, second downside here is that of course we are running uh, two data stores um, plus our applications need to deal with a bit of added complexity. So what you see here on the right hand side is a configuration file. So this is the config file that will be potentially on all of these web apps. And this can be dynamic configuration, you can use services for that. But for the sake of this example, imagine it's a config file, which contains the, the database endpoints that the applications will um, connect to. So they will understand or your applications need to understand that there is a primary uh, read and write endpoint, which I have to use. So this is primary.db.com. So the left one here. And then there will be a db read endpoint for US. And your applications need to be aware of this fact so that the web apps in the US East region, even though it's the exact same code as the web app in the US, they need to understand, okay, I'm actually in this US East region in the US. I can use this data store for my reads. This makes sense if you have um, read heavy workloads, right? If you're doing way more reading of data than you actually do writing, then this is maybe a, a, a nice and very, very effective approach because you're splitting a lot of work away from your primary data store and you let this read replica do it. So makes sense for um, read heavy approaches or workloads. 
Um, and also remember that we wanted to achieve high availability as well, right? So what we can do, oh yeah, and before I, before I go there, what needs to happen, of course, is this data store, because it's our primary, it needs to asynchronously or somehow replicate all of the changes. So every write, every update um, to this read replica. So there has to be some sort of a process. If you use a managed service, then this will be done for you. If you use something, you know, custom built, then you have to do this on your own. But every read, uh, sorry, every write in the primary needs to be reflected in the read replica. And this is very complex because, you know, it needs to be very reliable. You don't want this data store, this read replica here to get out of sync. And you have to be aware of the fact that if this is an asynchronous replication, then there will be a delay um, from, from when the primary receives a write until the read replica will reflect that write. You can minimize this, this delay as much as possible, but uh, because these databases are in different continents, in different regions, there will be some sort of a, of a delay. So your applications need to be aware of this fact. And if you, for some use cases, need the absolute most up-to-date information on your reads, then you should consider reading from the primary here. But depending on your business, case and your requirements, you know, it may be more beneficial to um, read from the read replica because you get lower latency usually. And so the second advantage of doing this, because we were doing or we wanted to have high availability, is this functionality to promote the read replica in the case of an outage in one of the, uh, you know, in, in the primary region. So EU West one here was now uh, our primary region. Something happens to the whole region. The region goes down, for example. What we can do, and let me mark this. So let's say this thing here is now um, completely out of service. We'll make it red. So the primary just died. Up until the last uh, few seconds before it died, the data was replicated to our read replica. So this read replica, it will contain most of the data, but we have to be aware of the fact that it could be missing some of the very latest data that was changed in the primary, right? So uh, not 100% uh, consistent in the, fa in the case of a failover. And so this failover could now happen. So we would need to understand some, some process needs to understand that this primary here just, uh, just died. Um, Route 53 will redirect our traffic to the US East one region if it detected that the whole region here went down. So this will be now uh, also a, a let's, let's remove this. This connection here is now gone. All of the traffic comes here. And now this database needs to be promoted because it is not only a read replica anymore, it's now a primary. So again, if you're using a, a managed service from something like AWS, this will happen uh, automatically. If you're building this you know, on your own custom build, then you need to do this as well. So this database is now our, um, our primary, promoted to primary, and it will start to accept writes before it didn't, right? Before it only accepted reads. And you can already see that this is gonna be um, fairly complex if you do this on your own, because once this outage is over and um, you want to bring out, you, you bring your original primary back into the system, you need to sync everything back from the read replica to the original primary, because you want them to be in the same state again. And once that happened, um, the original primary will be promoted back to the to the actual primary and this read replica will then be demoted to a read replica again. But as I said, if you use a managed service from AWS, for example, from, uh, from Amazon RDS, then this will be built in and you can use these functionality without investing a lot of time and complexity to build such a um, read replica and failover system approach that we could take. 
instead of having a primary and then only read replicas, which are only able to, to be read from, we would have multiple primaries. So this is a multi-primary setup with something called sharding. We have two data stores, one in the EU, one in the US. You see that the names have changed slightly because both are now equal and both are primaries. But we are trying to use something called sharding um, to minimize the amount of problems we get ourselves into. And what, what are those problems? Imagine you are writing information, let's say about the same customer, right? Customer with the ID one, two, three. You will find this row, let's say it's a single, a single row in both of those data stores, information about customer one, two, three in the EU and in the US. Problem, uh, problem arises if you have two writes with different content coming from two different web applications um, and they're hitting the EU and the US database. So if they happen at the very same time or close to the same time, which write will take precedence? And you will run into things like, you know, uh, write conflicts. To avoid coming or getting into issues with, with write conflicts, we can try to use sharding where <clears throat> we would say data about my European customers, for example, would only be um, written to the EU database and data about my US customers would only be written to the US database. Where you read it from doesn't matter at all, um, but you could try to do that. You could try to follow this approach to minimize um, merge conflicts or write conflicts, I should say. You have the advantage of, first of all, using two different databases, which will split the load and uh, you know the, uh, the actual stress that you put on those data stores. Um, you would need to do asynchronous replication in both ways, right? So because um, writes can happen to the EU database, the US database needs to uh, get uh, consistent with it. Same thing could happen in the US, writes happen here and the EU database needs to be in sync after a short amount of time. But you have the same advantage of the EU West region could fail completely and the US uh, region could, could fail completely, you could do a complete failover, right? So again, let's imagine our um, EU West region fails, we'll delete this um, connection. And because, because we have a, a multi-primary, this data store here, it doesn't even need to be promoted because it's already uh, promoted, it is already a primary. So the US data store will just keep functioning as expected and the web applications will write, nobody will notice that this data store or this EU region uh, failed. And so everything will work as it was before because we're already dealing with the primary. A more interesting example would be if, let's say the region is okay and everything in this region works, but this EU data store uh, would become unhealthy. Um, let me change the color. So the eu.tv.com just failed. Now we have a US data store, which is still functioning properly. Similar to before, the EU data, uh, the EU web apps can now just start reading and writing to the US data store. And the US data store keeps functioning as it was before. It's already a primary. Things will be just fine. Only downside, of course, the EU web apps will suffer from increased latency because they have to make requests to the US based data store. And potentially um, this US data store will become very busy because it's now serving, you know, potentially double or more than double of the, the traffic. Um, you have to, you know, take care of that, but at least you have an option to fail over from the EU region to the US data store. Okay. What have we learned today? Again, this is a small snapshot of what is out there and what has happened over the last few years in this area. The biggest takeaway I think should be, be very clear of what you're trying to achieve in terms of 
making your data stores multi-region. And if we recap the three things that we heard, um, first of all, we talked about having a single primary, which is fine if we want to, you know, be uh, safe against our own mistakes, so to say, the outages of the web apps, you know, there, if we, if we use a single primary and multiple regions for the web apps, we can still be safe. Um, so this is simple, right? Simple, single primaries, it's, it's easy to do it. You're not adding a lot of complexity to your systems, uh, but of course it's very limited. Then the second approach uh, we, we've talked about is using read replicas and uh, potentially something like a uh, failover where you promote your read replica. Um, there we have definitely we have some performance improvements, I would say, because we can now use a second data store which is closer to some of our user base. Um, on the other hand, you're already adding some complexity to this overall system because there is a lot of you know uh, configuration that needs to be changed which endpoint should be used by which application and uh, what happens in terms of or what happens in in the case of a promotion and a demotion of the the read replica so some complexity um, and there is for sure a, a replication lag even if it's just a few milliseconds it's something that you didn't have to deal with before, right? Second, our third approach we've talked about is uh, this multi-master where, sorry, multi-primary, where um, we were using two or more data stores, which were able to uh, read and write. So all apps, all the web servers from all regions could use all of the data stores to read and write. Um, which is very convenient and there is almost no lag in terms of promotion, right? One data store goes down, you don't even have to promote another data store to the primary because all of them are already primaries. So this is going to be a, a good user experience. There will be no, or in the, in the, in the best case, there will be no outage noticeable in terms of uh, data, but of course you have replication lag as well. And you're dealing with um, the complexity of potential write conflicts. Or if you want to avoid those write conflicts, um, you have to introduce sharding. So sharding meaning you start to write data from users in the US only to the US data store and you write data from your EU users only into your EU data store and you never write EU data into the US data store and you never write US data into the EU data store. The data will be replicated in the background still um, but by doing this strict separation of where to write you can uh, and actually introducing sharding you can, not 100%, but at least to a, to a good amount, you can uh, uh, get rid of those write conflicts. They will be just, you know, uh, less, uh, uh, it, it, they will appear in less cases, in fewer cases. Okay, so this is not, you know, a complete list of what you can try to do. This is not um, black and white, so to say, because um, there will be databases and, and technologies that try to promise that they can do all of it, but be aware and always look for the trade-offs and the implications on your architecture. And it, it, my recommendation would really be try to keep things as simple as possible for as long as possible. Um, because as long as, uh, as soon as you try to introduce you know, multiple data stores and they need to be consistent and so on. This is adding complexity to your system, which uh, is 
is uh, considerable and it's hard to go back from you know this type of multi data store approach if you if you you know use it for a while if you have introduced it all right this was part 2 of the high availability video series we've seen a few different approaches of how we can make our data stores and our databases distributed and highly available at the same time and we've seen the trade-offs as well. We've seen that you know, there is complexity involved and we need to be very clear about our expectations and our goals because every goal, every requirement requires different approaches. And we need to be very clear about what our applications expect from their underlying data stores. If you have any questions about this video or high availability, let me know in the comment section below. I'll also leave a link there to the first part of this series. Check it out if you haven't already. My name is Ramon Lopez and this is Success in Tech.